The important thing about asset protection is you need to do it when you don't need it. <laughs> and that, that sounds contradictory, but that's when you need to do it. You need to do it when it's not clear to you, you uh, that there are ju judgments coming down the road. You do not know of something that's about to happen. So it's not you engaging in activity that's intended to rip off a particular creditor or a particular class of creditors that you know are coming down the road after you. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. Uh, I'm flying solo today, but I think the topic that I'm going to talk about is one that at least some of you will find very interesting, and that's the subject of asset protection. Now, that phrase is used a lot very loosely, so maybe some people use it in, in many different ways, but the way it's generally understood is that asset protection relates to how do I protect the property that I've accumulated from lawsuits of various types, whether it's personal injury lawyers, whether it's even legitimate creditors, that perhaps you engage in a business where it's risky and you're concerned that you could lose your personal assets uh, if things go south in your business. So there are various threats. We know that we live in a world that's fraught with threats of various sorts to us financially, uh, legal and illegal threats. So asset protection is a valid concern. But I want to talk to you about, about what the rules are governing asset protection and identify some of the common tools that are used, uh, some from the most exotic uh, to more simple things, things with which you're already even at least somewhat familiar. So uh, I've introduced kind of the topic of asset protection uh, let me say some things that are typically excluded from that discussion. And that's uh, taxes are typically something that you don't uh, insulate your property from the, the legitimate tax collector. Now, remember, this is not tax planning. Of course, you can plan to, have, to owe fewer taxes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who think I can have asset protection so that the IRS cannot get to any of my assets and they're including, they mean legitimately owed taxes. Obviously, uh, not only are you likely to run into criminal charges in going down that road, but quite frankly, there are not laws designed, as you might imagine, uh, that will be enforced that will relate to escaping your what the IRS considers is your due uh, liabilities. So... I would also include things relating to support. Support is also one of those things that as a matter of public policy, we've decided that whether it's maintenance or child support, these are things that, that should be first in line to the extent that people are making claim on your assets. So many tools that you would use, not all, but many tools that would normally provide asset protection uh, as a public policy, we've decided that often those tools will not apply to support claims. So we have taxes, we have support claims. Uh, bankruptcy court has powers that many other creditors do not have, so to the extent that there's administrative costs, et cetera. So um, these are kind of the, the largest categories of exclusion. I'm sure that there are some other creditors that stand in a special position, maybe student loans, depending on the, the tool we're talking about to provide protection. Uh, some may not withstand that sort of threat. But if you think about it, that's not too much of a, of a disincentive to think about asset protection. If you, th if you think, okay, legitimately owed taxes, I'm going to have to pay that. I should plan to pay that whatever strategy I develop. If you say, uh, if I owe support for children, spouse also, um, if you say, resign yourself to say, yeah, I, I would pay that anyway, or I understand that, that to the extent I have such a thing, then I, I will pay those as well. 
So uh, the other matter, student loans, you pro- you may not have those as we're having this conversation. I'm assuming many of you are further, much further in your career. Uh, but uh, there aren't a lot of restraints, in my opinion. If you if you say that the universe of potential creditors out there um, is available except for those for protection, then I think that's a pretty good thing. So let, let me identify, though, some of the things that the, the tools that you may not acknowledge that already exist are ready at hand to use for these purposes. Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, we know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help you protect your family, your legacy, and your future. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning. Count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. One is there are homestead exemptions in virtually all the states. Now, some states, it's far less exciting than others. Missouri is not very exciting. 15000 bucks. I think the last I looked, yeah, it was 15000 bucks, which it changes and it, it's gone up. I, I remember when I first started practicing law, I think it was about... 4,000. So it's still, it's not a meaningful help when you're looking for protection from creditors. But So homestead exemptions can be powerful. So some people will choose to have a home, their primary home in a place such as Florida. Texas also is very good, uh, which uh, unless Florida has recently changed its laws, it's an unlimited homestead exemption. That means you can have a $10 million house. And if you have $10 million in it, uh, then if that's its value, then that's protected. Whatever, whatever your your the value of your house is, if that's your primary residence, it's protected. Now, this does mean residency in Florida, so you can't just own a house, a second home, and say that's my. I'm going to take a homestead exemption in Florida. But the good news is, if that is your primary home, if you're willing to go to the effort to make it your primary home then um, you, you just heard it's a short list of creditors that can, that can ever collect. I think, I think O.J. Simpson, in fact, uh, in the face of all the litigation against him, I think he had a house that was bulletproof, pardon the phrase, um, in, in uh, Florida. So homestead exemptions, these are easy to use, and depending on where you are, can be, can be very effective in terms of protecting a store of wealth. Another tenancy by the entirety, which uh, doesn't exist in all states, but it's a special status. It's the way it's when a married couple owns property and the statute permits that ownership to have special characteristics. It's not just a joint tenancy as it is in a number of states. A joint tenancy is a way of owning something where uh, whoever lives longer will typically have a right of survivorship. So that's... um, that's not particularly healthy. Or excuse me. It's not. It's not helpful if we're talking about asset protection. So joint tenancy with right of survivorship is a useful thing if you're doing estate planning, et cetera, uh, but not for asset protection. Now in Missouri, it has the quality of with right of survivorship. So you know when you own assets as a married couple in Missouri, it does have that quality. But it's more than that. It's called tenancy by the entirety. And as the term exit, as the term entirety implies, it it the law views it as a single ownership. So that means a creditor that comes against one of you cannot break that entirely, cannot force a sale of that asset as they normally could with joint owners of assets. In this case, it's protected. It can't be broken by a third party bringing a a suit and breaking it apart and selling, getting a judgment against one party and collecting. Um, The only way that you can end a tenancy by the entirety is by way of divorce or one of the parties choosing to to end a ownership of tenancy by the entirety. They can do that. They can convey the property to a third party, their their interest, and they can end a, either side, either spouse can choose to end a joint tenancy, a tenancy by the entirety. So in that case, um, that means that if you had a creditor that didn't have a judgment against both of you, then that would be a pretty good thing. That means that that they can't get at this asset, barring these, you know, these three or four special categories we talked about earlier. 
creditors can't get at assets owned that way. The only problem that I see with tenancy by the entirety, what what bugs me about that as a as an avenue for asset protection is that often these creditors that come along, depending on people's occupations, et cetera, uh, will be getting a judgment against both parties. And if it's a judgment against both parties, then then the tenancy by the entirety is no longer a help because you you own you both are owners and that and you both are liable as opposed to one of you being liable. So if you were in a situation though where um, I'll choose a what once was common, uh, say forty years ago, uh, you would have one spouse at home, uh, maybe a homemaker raising kids, another spouse working, and that spouse may be in a risky business. Uh, maybe it's a you know gynecologist or obstetrician or I mean different professions where there's high probabilities of lawsuits where maybe the malpractice coverage or other insurance coverage may very well not be adequate or its premiums may be just prohibitive. I've I heard that about some areas of the country that are notorious uh, for for litigation, um, and they have laws very favorable to to plaintiffs. So in that situation, yeah, tenancy by the entirety does give a ton of protection because it's it'd be very unusual to be able to sue the wife, right, to bring the wife in as well as the husband, assuming the husband's the doctor. Anyway, whoever's the doctor, uh, then then that would be an unusual scenario. So tenancy by the entirety is, yeah, that's a wonderful way to own assets in that scenario. Um what else is there other than that? I think you're probably familiar with corporations. Um, corporations, again, they can be very helpful. Um, a corporation is especially helpful in LLCs. Uh, they're especially helpful whenever the risk arises within the entity. So let's say that that you think all of the litigation that's likely to come your way is going to relate to something that is within the business. We'll call it within the box. So the box is what we'll call the corporation. So the wonderful thing about corporations and similar entities in terms of protecting you is you can take risks that emanate from the box and keep them in the box. So let's say the liability relate, you own a restaurant, the restaurant is incorporated and, um, and there's a, there's a injury in your restaurant. They all sue the you or the, the corporate entity. And when they get a judgment, then that judgment applies to everything in the box. So, you know, what's in the box is at risk. So if all your value is within the entity, then um, I guess that may not be very satisfying that, that you can lose, you know, what would be 90% of your net worth uh, because it's within the entity. Now, if you own a bunch of different corporations, different locations are often separately incorporated. That's often what real estate investors do is they all have each one of their properties in a different LLC. But remember, keep in mind that what's being accomplished with entities like that is you're really confining the liability to that container. And if if you have a lot of wealth outside that container, then that's pretty satisfying. So that's good news that corporations, obviously lawyers are big advocates of corporations and LLCs, things, things that, are, that limit the, the liability uh, to the entity, and then the entity owns it. Um, but again, if all your wealth is within that box, then you, it's a hollow victory that you've limited your liability to the box because all your wealth is in it. I mean, and that's often the case with a family business. But again, you can break those into pieces often. You can have, if you have different locations. So there are ways that, that even within the box, you can create subcontainers that will, you know, will contain uh, the, the liability. So, so corporations are, are wonderful for that purpose. Uh, but what about the extent to which you have liabilities beyond that? What about the extent to which you have you know, much of your wealth is spread around and it's not in the nature of a particular business, then it, it does become less effective for you. Another thing to keep in mind about corporations um, is that depending on the activity you're involved in, if you're involved in personal services, often a personal service corporation, for example, 
uh, will not limit the extent of the liability. So there are special categories, I'll say, of of occupations in which um, the law simply does not permit you to have a corporation to confine your liability or a corporate entity of some sort. A good example is lawyers. Lawyers, you know, it's a personal service. It's one that um, it's just a fact that we deal with that, it, you know, even though we form a personal service corporation um, of various forms, often they're partnerships though, uh, but they're limited liability partnerships, et cetera. There, there still are things which can spill over depending on the nature of the malpractice or whatever the actions are. So there are, there are professions where it is difficult to limit liability or claims to what's happening within the entity. But also, as to all of them will apply, the exception related to willfulness or um, sometimes it'll go so far as reckless indifference, phrases such as that, certainly anything that is intentional will almost always uh, pierce the container. So if you if you have a business and and you engage your you own the corporation and you engage in conduct that is malicious or intentional et cetera, then there's a number of public policies, if not statutes, that would exclude coverage uh, uh, to would not give you the protection you would expect. So I, I don't think I don't think I, we need to worry about that. I'm going to assume that you and I we are clear on on that that. We don't. We understand that if we engage in certain intentional malfeasance or conduct, that that we the law is not likely to give us much protection. But but as to other things, where incidentally you could you could be a business owner and you acted in good faith and you had an employee who did something willful, that your corporation will probably give you protection. The employee engaged in an act which you did not authorize, you did not approve. It was contrary to their job description. Uh, you know, if you own a company and you have a, uh, you know, thousands of employees, then it's going to happen sooner or later. Uh, that's going to stay within the corporation. I mean, barring some odd fact or circumstance that I can't imagine as I sit here. So the law does recognize that when you have a lot of employees, you can't be fully responsible for all those employees, and if you and if you have policies in place and you're doing the things you can do to minimize, you know the the the, the wrongs or the damage that that these people would rot or the probability that they would do such things intentionally, um, then then the law is willing to give you the protection. So uh, corporations can be a wonderful thing, subject to the things that I've just mentioned. We can talk more about that, but I want to get on and talk to, about the things that the many of you who have concerns that about liabilities that don't simply arise from a business activity, but you're concerned about your assets more generally. And that's that, you know, to the extent that you have assets in this world, then you're a target. And and that's a fact, and especially in America where there's a lot of, of litigation. So the trust exists, which I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of a trust. I'll take just I'll take just a few minutes and tell you what a trust is. A trust is is where you um, essentially transfer an asset to a third person, and you tell them that they're holding that asset. Um, they have legal title to the asset, but they don't have what the law calls equitable title, meaning that you have a bare, a naked legal title, but the benefits are to be owned by someone else, and that's that's called equitable title. Sorry to confuse you, but you with a trust breaks those two in half. Your trustee that will manage and, and legally own this asset as a trustee for the whoever the beneficiaries are, purely for their benefit, their enjoyment, their benefit. It's entirely for the beneficiary, not for the trustee. So there aren't a lot of players in this picture. You have what we'll call the settlor. That's just the person who creates the trust. Maybe call it you. Uh, now, can you name yourself trustee initially? Yeah, you can. Revocable trusts commonly do that. And at the risk of completely confusing it, you can name yourself also beneficiary initially. So you might say, why would I do that? Well, you're doing it because you know these are going to come apart 
over time. Over time, you'll become incompetent, and the role of, of, of the trustee will, will migrate from you to who you've named on the list. You've named a successor to a next trustee, so it'll automatically go out of you because you're incompetent now into the hands or the authority of another person. But the beneficiary will stay the same, which is you. So uh, then you die, and uh, at that point, that that role moves too. It moves to whoever you've named to be the next level of beneficiaries. And so you can see why I trust when it comes apart and these roles become independent, then yeah, it's a hugely important thing. But what confuses people is when they create a trust and all three roles are setting in the same person. So they're, they're saying, well, what's changed? Well, you've set the stage for a lot of change. Uh, it's just not happened uh, in a visible way that the world can see. But but the fact is, there is a trust, there is a trustee, uh, and there is a beneficiary. So if you take that idea and you say, well, how does that end up being asset protection? Asset protection um, is not a controversial thing to the extent that it's a trust that a third party created. So let's not have you anymore as the trustee, uh, as the, the settlor uh, or the trustee. But, but let's say that somebody you know maybe your parents created a trust and they named a trustee, call it their lawyer, and you are the beneficiary and they create this trust and they die. So you have a trust that's being run by this lawyer. You're the beneficiary, maybe you and your siblings. And if your parents were were very smart, as I'm sure they would have been, then they had a provision saying that this is what's called a spendthrift trust. And I that term I don't like because it suggests they think that their kids are going to be spendthrifts. That's not the purpose. It's it's merely saying we want asset protection for our children. So they call it spendthrift trust. So your parents create a trust in which they gave the trustee the authority to not pay anything that they didn't want to pay that you owed. So uh, the trustee can choose to not give money to you if there's a lawsuit coming against you. They can choose to give money only to you and, ne- and, and be forbidden to pay any of your debts. So there are, it, it's well accepted that you can insulate people you love by creating a trust for their benefit. But you notice what changed in these two examples. It's no longer you as the settlor getting this benefit. It's you, uh, a third, it's called a third party trust, but it's you as a beneficiary getting this benefit, but you weren't the settlor. And to the law, that makes a big difference. And if you think about it, you understand why. It's one thing for you to have had dumped into your lap. You didn't create this thing to shortchange creditors. Uh, this thing was created by your parents and you had no role in it. You were, de- you were named a beneficiary and you, you don't even have control over it. And that's important. You don't have control over it. It's another person. It's a trustee. So is the law willing to say that that, that your parents could create a trust, that, that your creditors couldn't get to your interest? Well, the law is saying, well, yeah, it wasn't you being devious and underhanded. And we can't even accuse your parents of being devious and underhanded, right? So now let's go back to that first example. You're the settlor yourself. You're creating the trust. You're naming yourself beneficiary. And let's say, though, you're, you're wanting to be really conscientious here, so you name a third party as a trustee. So you create the trust. You know, you're the beneficiary. You get the benefits, but it's not you managing the money, you having control. You pass that over to a trustee. It's out of your hands. You no longer have control of it. Some states have trouble with that idea. And I can tell you, historically, all states have grappled with that. And it's a controversial subject because it's where somebody creates their own trust, albeit they transfer control to a trustee, but you wrote the rules. The rules weren't imposed by your parents and you simply get contacted by a trustee and says, I I have something here. I'm going to send you in the mail when I feel like it, money, assets, uh, but you don't have control of it. You know, All states are comfortable with that. What they're not comfortable with is a bulletproof trust that you create for yourself. You can do it for your kids, you know, and and incidentally, I'm a big, big advocate. When you're doing estate planning, yeah, I I think it's almost neglect. (laughs) That's a harsh word. But anyway, it's a failure on the part of parents to be truly 
diligent in in transmitting the 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 fruits of their labor over a lifetime to their children in a package that that will give them so much more benefit than they could give themselves because as I'm about to tell you here there are constraints when, for your ability to go out and do that you won't even after I give you this explanation as to some ways you can do it it's still not it's still not as good as as that third party who creates it and you you're the beneficiary and guess what you are not liable for any of your debts that that the rules of the trust don't permit to be paid so it's a it's a marvelous thing subject incidentally remember this this precious category i told you about a while ago uh if you have taxes due there's no bulletproof trust regarding taxes. You can be sure that that didn't come from Washington. Uh, similar thing regarding support. You know, that it's public policy doesn't want you using trust or your parents, for that matter, using trust to avoid support obligations. So, so there are a few limited exceptions. But beyond these limited exceptions, this is a pretty good tool. So I think I made my point to you, the importance of creating trust for your kids. And don't just dump it in their lap when you pass away. You can do so much better because you've not given it to them as well as you can, giving them all the fruits that they could otherwise have by dumping it in their lap. Um, even if they're brilliant kids, even if they're uh, graduates of, of Wharton MBA programs, they can't create for themselves what you can create for them for the reasons I just described. But let's go back to your doing asset protection for you. Uh, and your spouse, you can you can create an asset protection trust, a okay, domestic asset protection trust, um, in some states more effectively than others. Some states have decided that you know it's a good idea to have liberal. I'll use the word liberal rules regarding allowing a settlor you to go and create your own asset protection trust for you. Um, there are a number of states that decided that, you know, that's that's good business. It brings people and assets into the state, and and uh, it, it's, a, it's a wise policy to have. And there are a number of articles that have been written about the philosophy underlying this as a public policy. Is it good? Is it bad? Does it encourage bad behavior? And, and, and some commentators, you know, uh, that I've, I've read uh, have various views on this. But of course, among the, the best arguments are those who point out that, look, we already acknowledge asset protection in the forms I already described to you, you know, today in this discussion. I've told you two or three uh, tools that are commonly used. We recognize them as, as uh, insulating or inoculating sort of people from uh, creditors of various sorts. This isn't a foreign concept. Uh, we're, we're just saying that, that when you know, we want people when they form such an entity to do it with uh, the sort of checklist that we want and with the exceptions that we want. So South Dakota, uh, Alaska, Delaware is really good. Um, Nevada, these are all states that have a reputation as being pretty strong in, in their states, in their statutes regarding this sort of asset protection. Um, Missouri, incidentally, I will tell you, it's not bad. Missouri is pretty good, in fact. It's not it, it, It's not on the list of maybe the top most desirable jurisdictions, but it's a little bit of a hassle to go form a trust there and have some assets, maybe especially real estate, that are going to be outside the state. So there's a little bit of concern that, that those may be governed by the laws of another state, even though when you set up the trust, say it in South Dakota. Let's say you go to South Dakota, you set up the trust. Well, any assets that you have within the state of South Dakota – um, such as financial assets, you know, you can have create accounts that are governed by the state or, or institutions in the state. So those are those are probably pretty strong. Uh, but other assets, businesses that do business out, outside there, that's a tough one. Uh, real estate that's in other states, you may have a creditor that brings a lawsuit in the other state claiming that 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 state should have authority over its assets and arguing that it's a public policy violation for Missouri to comply with the the normal laws that exist between states called comedy, not comedy. It may end up as comedy, but it's C-O-M-I-T-Y. So states, for the most part, try to defer to other states' laws, and, and yet every state has the exception that if it's a law that relates to something of fundamental importance uh, of a particular state, and this might be such a law, then that state can choose to not in, 
not acknowledge it. So there aren't many cases that tell us yet about that. But but yes, um, it, it's not at all unreasonable to think about creating a domestic asset protection trust uh, in a state such as Delaware. But Missouri is not bad. And I'll give you in in the next uh, little bit. How much time do we have here? We're at 30. Uh, we're sitting at about 30 minutes right now. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll take about another nine minutes or so. And uh, here are the characteristics you need to think about if you're thinking about a domestic asset protection trust versus um, an overseas trust. I think that you, you have to understand that whenever you create the trust, it's got to be a trust over which you do not continue having control. I can tell you that, and this should make sense to you, many of these things that I've told you today are things that your common sense would say, I don't believe that courts would permit that, or I don't believe that legislatures would permit that, or I don't believe that that's a good social policy. So that sniff test is often reliable. And similarly regarding creating a a domestic asset protection trust is that whenever you create a trust in the United States versus offshore, when you create a trust in the United States, you've got to give up control of it. And for that matter, quite frankly, you even have to give up control wherever you do it. Uh, so that, that's not a distinction between those that are in the United States versus those that are abroad. Um, in all cases, you have to surrender your control. That has to be um, a term that, that's within the documents, is that you no longer have say over this trust. And, and that should make complete sense to you. I mean, if you have the ability to change the rules or to direct the trustee, or heaven forbid, if you're the trustee, I mean, it should be apparent to you that that doesn't pass the sniff test. No, no country, especially America, is not going to have laws that are going to allow you to do that. So keep in mind, if, you, if you're if you going to create an asset protection trust, you have to be willing to give up some meaningful control of the asset. Um, now, can you continue being a beneficiary? Remember that that first example where you create a trust, you, you originally named yourself as trustee and beneficiary, well, now you know you can't be trustee, so... So you know that you can no longer be trustee, but can you be beneficiary? I mean, that's, that's critical. Otherwise, there's no point in having this conversation, right? Uh, we're, we're, otherwise, we're talking about just estate planning for the benefit of somebody else. This conversation is about, can you do something to protect yourself? And I'm telling you that, yes, you can, but you cannot be the trustee. You can be the beneficiary. But there have to be rules. In Missouri, there are a few rules in particular that you have to pay attention to. And and some of them are very technical. Like in Missouri, there has to be someone at all times other than just yourself that is eligible to receive benefits by this third-party trustee. Well, that's not hard to accomplish. You name somebody else as a as a co-beneficiary. It doesn't mean they have to actually get anything. It just means that they have to be eligible. So it means that the trustee has to have the authority if he or she chose to confer benefits to someone other than just yourself. So when you first hear that, you think, well, that reduces the value of this. But not really. Think it through. You're, you're, you just have another person. And this is not gamesmanship. They have to be truly eligible to receive benefits. But again, it does not mean that, that your trustee will pay those benefits to them, but the trustee has to have the authority. And, and you see how this is a little bit addresses that, that concern in terms of public policy that, that this, this invites people to behave in an irresponsible, even a dishonest way. So one way Missouri has addressed it is adding that requirement. And that's, that's reasonable. Some states wouldn't have that requirement. They would just require that, that you no longer have control. You create it, you put your own terms, but then you hand it to the trustee. But the trustee has the discretion to, to pay out the money and, and they have a fiduciary duty to do the right thing. Um, so so we, can, and we don't have enough time here to talk about some of the terms that you would want to be in that trust to be sure that, that your trustee has the ability to protect you from creditors as well as to let you enjoy you know, the fruits of your labor at the same time. So it is something, though, that can be walked and it can be walked successfully. One other thing I definitely want to get to before we wrap up here is anytime you use a trust— one thing you've got to be incredibly conscious of is there's a, there is a set of laws 
an act that exists in virtually every jurisdiction in the United States. And this, this regards fraudulent conveyances, or the newest version is the Uniform Fraudulent Conveyances Act. Missouri has adopted it. Virtually all states in some form have adopted this. Here's the reason this is relevant. It's a huge issue when you're creating an asset protection trust. Among the purposes of this statute is to assure that people do not, and I quote, uh, hinder, delay, or defraud creditors. Hinder, delay, or defraud creditors. So there are a number of court cases across the country involving people who, in anticipation of a failure of their business, or they see smoke on the horizon, or maybe a lawsuit has been filed against them, then they run out and they try to form this asset protection trust. I can tell you that doesn't work. It violates the Fraudulent Conveyances Act in virtually every state. And it should, right? I mean, you should be suspicious if I'm describing to you something here that sounds too good to be true. Oh, you mean I can can be sued and then I can go form this entity and suddenly I can uh, walk away and have no liabilities? Uh, I'm judgment-proof. that, that should not pass the sniff test. So the important thing about asset protection is you need to do it when you don't need it. <laughs> and that, that sounds contradictory, but that's when you need to do it. You need to do it when it's not, it's not clear to you, you uh, that there are judge, judgments coming down the road. You do not know of something that's about to happen. So it's not you engaging in activity that's intended to rip off a particular creditor or a particular class of creditors that you know are coming down the road after you. So whenever you see litigation trying to overcome an asset protection trust, it often regards that allegation. It says, this person knew about me. It doesn't mean that you have to, that that if you suspect any lawsuit in a particular uh, business or profession, then then suddenly it's a fraudulent conveyance. No, that's not what the law is. The law is if you know of anything in particular, then you're vulnerable on that one. Another thing is that that courts are um, there are a few cases where courts have overruled an asset protection trust because what somebody did was they essentially impoverished themselves so that they knew that they were creating a situation where they couldn't pay their existing creditors. So let's say that that you have $10 million and your ongoing costs of your living or maybe ongoing costs associated with uh, routine expenses of a business um, may be a million dollars a month or more. Um, Then if you you take everything you own suddenly and put it inside an asset protection trust, then that's pretty much the same thing, isn't it, as what I was describing a while ago, being conscious of creditors you know, running from a particular creditor or a group of creditors. Well, when you know that you've impoverished yourself so that there are definitely going to be expenses coming along that you can't pay and you knew that, uh, then then that's there's a good chance that that trust will get turned over, meaning that the, the, the court will, will pierce it and it won't provide the protection. But short of that, where, where you leave some assets outside your trust, you don't put 100% of what you own in the trust, but, but, I mean, that's kind of the whole idea. I mean, even if you could, I bet you wouldn't because you're living with some constraints. We won't get into them today, but, but when, you, when you put assets into an irrevocable trust, I don't know that I used that word up to this point in this show. I should have used it uh, earlier on. The, this, just to be clear, this is an irrevocable trust uh, whenever we're talking about asset protection. There's no asset protection for revocable trust. And again, doesn't that make sense? So obviously you're not going to be protected from a creditor and then you, if the creditor loses and goes away, then you just abolish the trust. So obviously these are irrevocable trusts. So whenever you create an irrevocable trust, you do have to live by certain rules. So you probably wouldn't want to put 100% of your assets in there anyway. You probably, even if you could and have all the protection, because most people don't want to live with rules on everything. They just want to know that there's some substantial portion of their assets that they know that they know that they know will be protected. Maybe that's 50% of your assets. Maybe it's 20. Uh, for some of you, it's 10%. 
Uh, but it, maybe it's it, the law might permit more than fifty percent. I'm not. I don't want to tell you that that you have to have a huge pot of money sitting outside your trust. That's not true. You just you just can't so impoverish yourself that that your standard of living alone tells you that you're essentially ripping off your creditors. Um, that that's that's not fair play in the mind of of legislators and courts. So I've not talked about offshore. The reason I'm not is that um, there are a number of of countries that that have laws that are designed to attract people. Uh, Cook Island, for example, is right now very attractive. They have, they have uh, laws that are very favorable, very protective of people who create trust. All that is, is good and great. And, and I don't question that these jurisdictions are prepared to protect their asset protection business, you know, in those islands is where they make a lot of money is uh, internationally. Uh, I think they, the, the law will protect you there. The problem is that your body is here in the United States, and that's how people have have ran into problems, have run into problems in these asset protection trusts that are offshore, is that somebody will sue them, uh, they'll get a judgment, and then the person will, will tr- uh, bring an action to collect the judgment. So you're there in court, in a court in the United States, remember, because the, the, the creditor can sue you here, right? I mean, even though your assets are somewhere else, the creditor can sue you. So the creditor sues you, you're in court, and they, they present evidence that you have had all these assets, or maybe even that you do have all these assets if they're not concealed. Um, and so, and you may have to disclose them. So I'm not, I, I, let's not even entertain the idea that you would defraud the court. That's really bad outcomes. <laughs> so anyway, so the judge knows you have assets in this trust in some form. And you're saying to the judge, I don't have any control of it, judge. So that may win in some courts in the United States, but I can tell you that there are courts, and you can read these cases, where the judge says, I think that you're guilty of contempt. I'm telling you to pay this person this money. And you're saying, Judge, sorry, you know, I'd like to. Um, I know you think I'm rich, but I just don't have any control over it anymore. I can tell you a lot of judges have had that person handcuffed in the courtroom and taken to the jail. And declared in contempt and said, you're going to sit there until you you decide that you have the authority to make a phone call to somebody to do this. Now, in a way, it's a game of chicken um, because the judge can't keep you forever in there if, if it's contempt because the judge contempt is only to get you to do the right thing. It can't be punishment. So the judge is betting that you do have the power to do it. And quite frankly, History has shown us that often people can make a phone call and get get money sent, uh, but it is in control of the trustee, not the person. So, but the person can sit, and there are cases where the person sits in jail for a long time, saying, "I don't have control of it anymore. There's nothing I can do. It's an asset protection trust, and the trustee's forbidden to pay money under these circumstances." Uh, which would that would be the language you'd want in such a trust, right? So to me, that's not gratifying. I just know that, that judges get offended in the United States. Your body is here, and that's the problem is it's different if you live somewhere else but and the creditor were here. But you live here. The creditor's probably in the United States. Even if they're not, they're going to resort to United States courts. And you, you're standing in front of a judge saying, sorry, I, yes, I do have a trust, but I can't do anything about it. It's in Cook Islands. Uh, that, that sometimes doesn't end well. So that's not so much a legal answer for you as a practical answer for you. So um, I'm not a big fan of the offshore trust. I think that we have wonderful tools here. They may not be quite as good on paper um, as as the offshore trust because you can do you know just a, a lot of complex things with offshore trusts. So I don't want to diminish them. I just want to tell you at the end of the day. It, you're standing in front of a judge in the United States saying you won't do something. You're saying you can't do it. And uh, I, I've just, I find that courts, when they want something done and they think you're playing games with them or they don't approve of what you're doing, um, they can make life hard. So that that's a practical concern more than, than if this were a law school exam, I might say, yeah, international you know, domestic asset trust, you can do things that you can't do in the United States. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about what happens in a practical way versus you know what the the language of your trust says, or the language or the statutes of the jurisdiction say. Whether it's Cook Island or Bahamas or wherever it is, at the end of the day, it's what happens to you where you stand in the United States. So, 
Anyway, that's an introduction to asset uh, protection. I think it's a great thing to do. I'm, a, I'm an advocate of it. Uh, and depending on your circumstances, you could use any one of these tools. Uh, an irrevocable, irrevocable trust is a marvelous, marvelous asset for that purposes or a, or a, uh, a legal mechanism for that purpose. Uh, but you just need to, to go into it with your eyes open that you live with some limitations. But you also get some, some genuine protection. So hope that was helpful. This has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act, a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week, we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.